Good afternoon, everyone. Belated birthday wishes, Liam. So good afternoon, great to see so many faces in this room. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today the founding dean of Jindal School of International Affairs with us, Professor Dr. Sriram Chalya. In fact, you can see uh, behind the cameraman over there the front cover of Sriram's most recent book, The Modi Doctrine, which is in fact the theme of today's lecture. Uh, the book is about foreign policy of the current Prime Minister of India. This is uh, Sriram's fourth book, um, but most recently, in fact, recently presented a copy of the book to the President of India, now former President of India as well. Um, and uh, Professor Chalia is also a regular commentator on Indian national television on issues of foreign policy. So you have it on good authority here today that, that what he is talking about are very live and topical issues of foreign policy in India. Um, and it should be a very interesting and, and relevant lecture to those of you studying arts, international affairs or international politics in particular, but all of us here who, who are interested in learning about India and its domestic and foreign policies. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I hear there are four universities represented here. So that's really fantastic. And uh, I want to just congratulate Sean and the Center for Australia Studies here to you know, create all these amazing opportunities for student mobility for all of you to come to India and learn from uh, what I would call uh, one of the most dynamic universities in this country. Uh, we are new, but uh, from the time you would have spent here, you would have seen um, quite a bit of uh, innovation and talent out here, which is remarkable by Indian standards. So I welcome you all. Uh, congratulations to all the cricket fans. You won the Ashes. So that, um, I think, is good time for Australia. Um, but today, I want to uh, just help you understand um, what India means to the world and how it's um, reaching out to the rest of the world, including, of course, it goes without saying, uh, uh, with Down Under. So um, first, I'd like to give some simple propositions. How many of you are not social science or humanities majors? Okay, quite a few. So I'm going to keep it very simple and, um, uh, you know, uh, cater to a kind of a common denominator and um, avoid some of the jargon of political science. Um, and I'd be happy to speak with some of you who may want more advanced uh, thinking on this topic. But the first thing I want to say is that um, uh, India is at the present juncture, in my view, uh, a wannabe great power. As in, a great power is, you know, a very, very um, influential country that can exert um, force as well as persuasion uh, on far away parts of the world. Uh, so, and can actually mold the international environment as per its domestic will or, or preferences. That's usually how we define a great power, right? Um, so in today's um, estimation, there are only two great powers, namely, anyone? Yeah, your neighbor and United States, right? So these are the only two um, existing great powers that have um, substantial influence far away from their borders in very, very distant shores. They have economic, military, or what we call strategic influence. So right now, there's no question about the capabilities of these two major powers. India is not yet a great power. That's the first point I want to make. Um, but it has the potential to be one, someday. Uh, and, um, Right now, we are going through a kind of a uh, phase when we have realized that we have the potential, but we know that we are still far away from uh, catching up with China or the United States in military, economic, or even soft power, which is defined as you know 
the power of attraction. Um, so there are lots of uh, gaps between our aspirations and the reality. So that's the first uh, you know, major point I want to make. And in many ways, the Indian foreign policy can be defined as a quest for greatness, unfulfilled quest for greatness. Um, and the, I'll go to the reasons why it's still unfulfilled and what needs to be done. But there is a lot of frustration among India's upwardly uh, mobile middle classes uh, to be able to punch uh, in the international arena and to be able to be recognized as a, a great power or, or a superpower. And there's a lot of nationalistic fervor in this country where people want to be seen as uh, big and influential and acknowledged so by the rest of the world. Uh, but on the other hand, the state apparatus, the bureaucracy, as well as the um, historical baggage have not enabled India to really live up to that potential. So what are these hurdles uh, and what can India do to overcome them? Uh, in my book, I've argued that you need political will at the top to change some of the lacunae to, to overcome some of these lacunae. The first uh, lacuna, of course, is the lack of will to be a great power. Um, you know, it's a psychological thing. Uh, you cannot be top dog unless you really want to be one, right? And um, although the middle classes and, uh, and the aspiring uh, upwardly mobile classes have wanted uh, all along for India to be a superpower, um, this is not widely shared. And there is still a kind of a fundamental disagreement about what should be our goal in the world. Uh, should it be simply to exist and uh, coexist harmoniously with everyone else? You know, peaceful coexistence. Or should it be to try and extend our influence? Uh, I'm not using the word dominance because that's where the debate comes in. So what is the what are the hurdles? The first thing for India, um, which has lacked, is the political will at the top for many, many decades. Uh, India has been relatively content with less. Indian elites, uh, our career bureaucracy, the foreign uh, service, our um, uh, political leaders, they've been largely, uh, until recently, been pretty content with, at most, pretending to be um, a regional power in South Asia alone. And since 1971, when um, in Pakistan was broken up through military intervention, uh, and a new nation called Bangladesh was created. Since that moment, India has been um, s superior in our own region, in the sub-region of South Asia. India has been the predominant power. Uh, but then, the, if the ambition stops at being influential in your own neighborhood uh, and not uh, striking out further afield, then you cannot be a great power. You need to be, so if you look at the map of, of the world and look where India is, in what we are now calling Indo-Pacific, or, or prof, formerly known as Asia-Pacific, um, you will find that um, the, you draw a radius with India in the center, and then see how far our influence goes. It's thicker, immediate, in the immediate neighborhood, gets thinner, thinner, and then vanishes as you go beyond Africa on the, on the western side and likewise beyond Southeast Asia on the eastern side. So um, how to expand one's influence? Um, through what means? And should we even expand or not? These have been the dilemmas that have bogged down India, India's rise. And a lot of uh, leaders in the past, until Narendra Modi, uh, have been uh, satisfied being a regional power. Uh, I argue in the book that uh, the current prime minister wants to India to become a global power, uh, to become a great power like China and the United States. Uh, but the arguments against becoming a great power are, as I said, um, motivated by historical baggage. 
first one um, we don't like empires we don't wish to behave like empires and dominate or aspire for hegemony over other people we are a um, post-colonial nation that struggled against British uh, imperialism and we um, do not um, aspire to dictate terms to anybody else. You know, non-interference non in internal affairs of other countries, um, cooperation with other countries without seeming to be mm, dictating to them. Um, so, there's one um, Indian scholar, Amitabh Matu, who actually taught at Melbourne, some of you might know him, um, who argued that India was a reluctant superpower, meaning they just don't have the DNA to want to dominate, uh, or they didn't for a long time. And um, some have also called it a soft state, and they all these, these they all these labels um, that capture this uh, dilemma I'm talking about whether we should aspire to be great and powerful or not. Um, so the British Empire, if you go back in time, you know India was called the jewel of the um, in the crown of the British Empire. They used uh, Indian resources and Indian manpower to dominate the world. Um, from the, have you all been to the India Gate in Delhi, the monument? You you know what it is, right? There are names of sepoys or like, you know, petty subaltern soldiers um, who fought for the British Empire but who were Indian and who were sent to Africa, to Europe, to East Asia, to, to farthest corners of the world to fight on behalf of the British Empire and who died for fighting for the British Empire. So, um, after independence, there has been this baggage saying we should not deploy military in other countries, definitely not far away from our borders. We should not even try to have a muscular kind of a position where we are seen to be getting involved in other people's affairs. We are, um, you know, a post-colonial country and should uh, respect the sovereignty of other countries, that kind of thing. So. Uh, and we should not definitely replicate what the British did by uh, using the enormous resources of this country to try and, um, and establish hegemony. So this has been a kind of a, you can argue a guiding principle and some would argue a bottleneck. Um, because what it has done is it has reduced the ambition in Indian foreign policy to want to be doing more and to be more proactive and to be actually um, spreading their influence further and further. Um, and related to this, of course, e are resources. And India has been historically, um, since colonial uh, era, a very poor country uh, with lots of resource challenges. Uh, at the time of independence, uh, by one estimate, 90% of the society was what we would in the UN language of today call below poverty level. So um, feeding for ourselves and um, uh, just surviving was the you know, goal for the first few decades after independence, after 1947. And um, whatever influence we had um, through our first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, was based on a kind of um, soft, uh, attraction for India as you know a country that is non-threatening a country that uh, did not join either the Soviet or the American blocs during the Cold War a country that was wanting to be a leader of the developing world without um, bossing around so um, but what has happened in the last especially in the last 10 years and definitely in the last three years uh, is, as you know, uh, India has been clocking very high economic growth uh, and has over time also been uh, enhancing its military capabilities. And uh, most, 
projections for great power status put India on par with China and the United States by 2030 or so uh, at the current rate of uh, economic and military uh, advancements. So we are living in a rapid transformation era. So as opposed to the 1950s, 60s or 70s or even 80s, um, there has been change in this country and uh, in one sense it has been galloping. Uh, while of course there are a lot of inequities and distributional problems within the country uh, in terms of income and wealth and other social differences. But there is a sense that this country has the potential to finally become a great power. Um, and the reluctance to deploy the military uh, in faraway countries or even in our own neighborhood, it's been occasional, not frequent. All these are slowly uh, changing. And in the, in, you know, for example, it's, it's now um, three years since the current regime is in power. And they have been frequently de deploying the military um, to counter terrorism uh, among our neighbors. Um, so there have been two known um, cross-border military raids by the Indian Army into Myanmar against uh, insurgent groups fighting uh, for secession. Uh, then there have been at least two or three known such uh, cross-border raids in, to Pakistan uh, to attack jihadist camps. So if you look at this, uh, and then there have been humanitarian rescue missions done by the Indian Navy, the Indian Air Force, um, in Yemen, in uh, Nepal, um, in the Maldives, and so on. So uh, you will find that slowly um, there is a sense that in India is also, I just want to add, um, getting more militarily involved in stabilizing the government in Afghanistan. So to some extent, the historic reluctance against deploying force, against using mi the military abroad uh, has, the, the, the reluctance is, is going down. And for those who want to see India as a major power, they would like to see more of this. Uh, and uh, India has not yet acquired any overseas military bases, which is typically, if you go historic, you'll find that um, the path to great power status for any major power usually happens through obviously accumulation of a lot of economic surplus, wealth production generation, as well as um, a military which has a sway uh, globally and which is able to do so, and is able to deploy uh, and acquire military bases. Um, so this is where we are seeing India at a kind of a crossroads. And the current prime minister is willing to break all the taboos of the past. And uh, he is an outsider to the traditional Indian political, although he was a chief minister of the western state of Gujarat for a long time, more than 10 years, he uh, came in as an outsider who had new and innovative way of thinking uh, and would not repeat the um, overcautious approach of the past in foreign policy. So, and he has done, as I said, a number of risky um, initiatives. He's taken quite a few. And secondly, he has that um, desire to see India as a global power, as I said before. Uh, but still, there are significant roadblocks. The bureaucracy does not share his view. Uh, they believe that India should remain content and just um, gradually work its way up rather than try and become a major power uh, overnight or very quickly. And um, they don't think that India should be in the great power competition at all. So you talk to a typical Indian bureaucrat and they will say that we are not competing or um, containing anyone. And our um, motto is not to repeat, we are a different kind of power and we don't need to do what the other great powers have done before. So this has been a kind of a consistent debate in the country uh, between a, what we call like a muscular approach and uh, a cautious approach. 
Um, and the prime minister has essentially taken the muscular approach. And he, I show in this book how um, he has overridden some of the bureaucratic objections and the historical baggage and has attempted to position India as a global power, especially by investing his own personal time um, in diplomacy. <coughs> you may have, if you have read the, the papers or seen the news, the Israeli prime minister is in India and uh, our prime minister is spending a lot of time with him. He does this with many, many other world leaders. Um, and uh, this, the reason behind the attention he devotes to foreign affairs is because he believes that um, this transition to great power cannot be delayed anymore. And that um, we need to be hyperactive in foreign affairs. Uh, so at the diplomatic level, the number of visits he makes overseas, um, the kind of splash that goes around when he's traveling, the um, you know the presence. One of the hallmarks of a major power is to be omnipresent in different corners of the world. Present not just in the form of having an embassy or a high commission, but present at the highest levels to show that you know, a president or a prime minister showing intent that we want to do something here in this part of the world. We want to cooperate, we want to build new alliances, new partnerships, we want to send out our navy, um, we want to enter into new uh, trade agreements, we want to attract foreign investment. So there's been a lot of hype around Mr. Modi's travels around the world. Uh, he's usually referred to as a kind of a rock star on the world stage and is always you know an attention grabbing politician um, which is new for india uh, typically indian politicians have been very inward looking barring nehru who i mentioned from, of the, from the 1950s most india i think uh, modi is the 14th prime minister if i'm not wrong um, most of the indian uh, leaders have been very inward looking domestically challenged, uh, preoccupied with party politics, the pulls and the halls of the different uh, provinces of India. Uh, you know, it's a big country and uh, um, national level leaders, their parties are also engaged in struggles at the provincial levels to win elections and such things. So in a five year, typical five year term, most of our prime ministers have devoted 90% of their time, if not more, to domestic issues. Um, Modi has changed that. Um, in fact, uh, last year when he did, um, as of I think the first two years, he had already visited more than 50 countries. The people um, who mind, who, who were upset about it and were saying, oh, you know, when will Modi ever come home? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, so there was a lot of, um, backlash from the traditional minded um, you know, opinion makers and policy makers saying that Modi is just you know too global and that's not required right now he must focus on domestic issues so the the demand that a prime minister should focus mostly on domestic problems and we have lots of those I'm not denying them and should postpone this global outreach until India is first fixed its uh, domestic problems. This has been one of the central um, hurdles to India becoming a great power. Um, in fact, whenever he travels, the, the, the opposition parties often ask, why is he traveling so much? Why is he going to such faraway countries? How much money is being spent? Couldn't we have you know, done uh, more work for farmers or for um, the urban poor instead of um, spending lavishly on his foreign uh, visits. So it's as, um, you know, the contrast is, uh, is as clear as this. You know, we cannot afford to have a global foreign policy. That's what the skeptics say. And the bureaucracy is part of that. Uh, he thinks that this is not an either or, or a win-lose kind of situation, but India cannot grow unless it's at the simultaneously um, expanding its influence internationally. It's not a sequential thing where 
I first fix my all my domestic problems and then maybe 20, 30 years later, I will think of becoming a superpower. Um, the crude um, way of uh, putting this objection is, you know, a lot of people often comment that um, how can India be a great power when it doesn't have enough toilets for its people? This is how it's often been portrayed. As in, unless our infrastructure and living standards and incomes of all this, of the entire society uh, rises, we should not even be considering all this, you know, over ambitious stuff overseas. Why should, it's, it's often seen as a, an egotistic thing for a country to want to become a great power when uh, it's not able to feed its poor. So, um, what Modi is saying is, I cannot feed my poor if I am inactive globally and if I am not, if I don't move towards becoming a global power. So what's the link between foreign policy and domestic development, economic development, socioeconomic? Uh, Modi has shown it uh, repeatedly in the last three years. And even before that, I show in an earlier chapter of the book how when he was the chief minister of Gujarat, he was already reaching out to far, far, far away parts of the world to attract um, investments. Um, Modi believes that the only way this country can be transformed is through international engagement. And not just routine international engagement, but high intensity international engagement, which means forming new partnerships, aligning with new, new, new uh, significant actors in different parts of the world, looking for attracting foreign direct investment into India from major centers of financial capital, um, and also, um, as I said before, using the military to stabilize key countries that um, may be a source of trouble for India. For example, through jihadist uh, extremism or, or um, other forms of you know, undemocratic outcomes that may ultimately hurt India. So these are all um, you know, part and parcel of his diplomacy. I invite you to read my book and uh, it will give you a lot more in-depth understanding of different regions of the world. But um, it cannot, the, the transformation cannot happen on the premise on one individual, right? It's a big country. And that's where we continue to face these roadblocks. Um, there are lots of uh, naysayers and skeptics who believe that um, India's time is not now, but maybe in 2040 or 2050, and that we should not even um, waste our energies on being a global player. Uh, be it in multilateral forums, or as I said, through our Navy or Air Force, or uh, through uh, economic and connectivity corridors. Um, the the, the spectacular rise of China is, of course, um, the immediate context in which Modi believes we need to speed up our ascent to become a major power. Because if we wait another 20 years and then think about it, by the time the entire international space would have been overshadowed by Chinese um, economic and military uh, presence and influence, and it would be impossible at that stage for India to break in and try to catch up. So his argument is that, you know, there's no contradiction between local and global, and we should be doing both. Uh, in fact, um, being global helps you with your local uh, economic uh, and social goals. Let me give you a small example of that. Um, in 2015, uh, Modi was in East Africa, and it was the first time an Indian Prime Minister has set foot in uh, that part of the world in around 42 years. And if you look at the map um, of the world, East Africa is the western end of the Indian Ocean. And India is supposed to be the pivotal country in the Indian Ocean region, in terms of the geography and size and capabilities. And yet, we had neglected um, our Indian Ocean neighbors for way too long. 
So when Modi was there, one of the agreements that was signed was for um, pulses, you know, uh, the cereals that people consume um, in the traditional Indian diet. The food price inflation had been going up uh, over the last 10, 15 years because of a crisis in Indian domestic agriculture. Production had fallen and demand had outstripped supply and so on. So food price inflation was really hurting the poor in this country. And the solution, and it's still ongoing, uh, I don't think they've found the perfect solution, but part of the solution lay in foreign policy and entering into agreements with major agriculture exporting nations. Um, and so the Pulses Agreement with Mozambique uh, is for, I think, 10 to 15 years duration, and it would ensure continuous supply of food grain at a fixed price that would uh, benefit the poor in this country and keep inflation under check. So that's an example of what we call developmental di diplomacy. Um, so likewise, there are, there, there are many deals Modi has done with um, uh, Persian Gulf nations. Um, for them, for, the, for example, for Abu Dhabi uh, in the UAE to set up a strategic oil reserve in this country for energy security, because we're heavily dependent on imports of uh, petroleum uh, products. Uh, so again, this strategic reserve where uh, the UAE would, I can't recall the stats, but you can look them up, uh, would actually store significant amount of oil and gas in this country without um, any um, interest charged. Uh, and that would uh, be accessible to India in terms of uh, to manage the shocks of the international volatility in um, oil and gas prices. So again, something that benefits ordinary Indians. I, I can give you many such examples, but um, the third one, of course, the bigger one is the foreign direct investment that India has been <coughs> attracting over the last three years. It's um, broken all records and continues to rise, uh, even though 2017 was a bit of a dip in the Indian economy, but the foreign investment continues to pour in, and uh, the annual increment in foreign investment is something like 20, 25% or more. So India is attracting a lot more foreign investment um, under Modi than ever before. And the reason for it is simple. It's because he's been able to woo um, global investors and sovereign wealth funds and governments around the world to take India more seriously and to consider it as a kind of a good return on investment. Um, he keeps saying uh, India is the most open major economy in the world. And there are a slew of reforms he has done to try and uh, make it easier for foreign investors because India's reputation uh, in global investment circles has been rather poor. It's been seen as a country that is obstructionist and full of red tape and corruption and, um, and so on. So to, to a great extent, Modi has convinced the international uh, uh, investor community that this you know, time is different. And you know, they have not been suckered into it. I mean, if you look at the fact uh, you ask any of these big investors who are pouring in billions into this country now uh, and who see it as a happening economy, it's because they see value for money, you know, and there's no way um, it's just Modi. I mean, there's some who were initially saying, oh, this is all, you know, um, this is pure exaggeration and there's no such uh, transformation happening at the grassroots and India continues to have problems. Well, yes, but there are improvements and what that's doing is it has really um, created a kind of a, a takeoff for attracting foreign investment into this country. So, um, and 2018, 2019 are supposed to be even better years with 7.5 to even 8% GDP growth being projected. So in a way, um, the way the economic diplomacy has succeeded in the last few years, it's because Modi has turned India from being, um, you know, uh, a problem country into an opportunity. 
And I think that's a big transformation. Uh, and whether it will last beyond him remains to be seen. That's why I said earlier that uh, one person cannot transform this whole country. And of course, there are plenty of obstacles still as I speak. But nonetheless, uh, there is a breath of fresh air. And what it's doing is it's um, increasing India's attraction in the eyes of the world. If earlier we were known for you know, our um, historical or cultural attributes like yoga and Kama Sutra and those kind of things and Bollywood, now increasingly it is India is seen as a place where actually there is um, fervent economic activity happening, one. And two, where there is an intent to rise and to become a major power. So I think we are on a hopeful trajectory. That's uh, you know one thing I'd like to share with you. Um, and as far as the security issues go, that's where the China factor is becoming more and more intense. And um, Indian uh, strategists are still scratching their heads as to what they should do about it. There's no clear, I mean, probably some of you know Hugh White and what's been happening in Australia, right? The debate about how you should um, square up with this giant um, on whom Australia is so dependent. India is, of course, not so dependent on China, but because it shares a direct land border on which there are frequent disputes and uh, there, and then the Chinese Navy, the PLA Navy, has been uh, making very, very deep inroads into the Indian Ocean region and beyond. So in the security realm, the biggest challenge India faces is um, what kind of a long-term strategy should we have vis-a-vis -vis China? Um, there's one view, a minority view, which is that, well, we can't do anything about it, and um, we should just accept it and um, get along with China and cooperate with them. There's no question of standing up to them or containing them. We cannot. United States is not able to contain China. Who are we to, to be able to stop them? So that's one argument, right, which is linked to that overcautious uh, attitude I mentioned at the beginning, um, which is that we just mind our own business and try and grow economically and, you know, we can't stop the rest of the world from becoming a uh, playground for Chinese uh, uh, hegemony. Uh, so the One Belt, One Road, or the Belt and Road Initiative, as it's called, has, over the last few years, uh, caused a lot of heartburn in this country uh, and a lot of debate. Should we join it? Uh, minority view says yes. Mm, but increasingly, Modi and this upward nationalistic Indian middle class says no because they believe that um, there is a kind of a um, conflict of interest, a fundamental clash of interests between India and China, and that it cannot be uh, shoved under the carpet because of the border dispute, because of this strategic encroachment, as it's called, into India's sphere of influence, and also what is seen as a check on India's rise. You know, China, Indian nationalists and Indian strategists, including Modi himself, um, although he wants to attract investment from China, uh, is primarily very wary of China from a military and security point of view. And the fear stems from the wounds of a war that the two countries had in 1962, where India lost um, hands down and uh, forfeited territory and has not recovered psychologically from it for a long, long time. But it's only now that India is slowly showing some resolve and it believes that it needs to, um, if not contain, then at least uh, build parallel um, coalitions of its own to withstand China's rise, meaning um, to be able to to hold ground and not to be pushed aside. Because what is happening is a displacing effect. Indian strategists see China's rise as a displacing phenomenon, not as an uplifting phenomenon. It's displacing our own influence from many of our neighboring countries. 
Take Sri Lanka for example. Now Sri Lanka has agreed to join the One Belt One Road and Sri Lanka has just leased one of its ports built by the Chinese for 99 years to China. The Maldives is the same story. So across the Indian Ocean, even Bangladesh with whom India has very strong um, historical links and, and was, found, was actually the founding um, patron of Bangladesh to be created in 1971. Even Bangladesh is open and has been accepting Chinese aid and is willing to host the Belt and Road Initiative and lots of infrastructure projects. So um, India at the end decided to boycott One Belt, One Road. Um, the biggest factor, of course, uh, against this is India views that the Chinese, again, I'm simplifying it, I'm oversimplifying it, but essentially India views um, Pakistan as a kind of a instrument of China to keep India bottled down in South Asia. Uh, it's like a, seen as like an albatross around our neck because um, China is, has been historically what they call an all-weather ally of Pakistan. And this, if you go back in time to the Cold War period, it was created, the alliance was created based on the shared fear of India and antagonism towards India. So here you have a situation, if you look at a geopolitical map, both our western and our northern borders, we see hostile forces. China and Pakistan, and these two are in alliance, and they continue to be. Um, so the One Belt, One Road, uh, the Chinese are pumping in $60 billion uh, for infrastructural improvement in China, in Pakistan. And simultaneously, the military cooperation they have with, the China, with, with, with Pakistan is, uh, you know, has yielded nuclear, nuclear program, missiles, and so on. So uh, this is on the back of the mind whenever we, you know, in many ways, to give you a visual sense, whenever average Indians, the majority of them, are asked, what's your view of China? They see a Pakistan <laughs> lurking behind China, behind its shoulders. Uh, and they see, that, they see that these two are out to hem us down here and, and prevent us from expanding our influence globally. So how do you handle this kind of um, mm, structure or confining uh, structure around us. This has been the big strategic challenge. And uh, one argument is that we must drive a wedge between these two all-weather allies. And given the um, unfortunate religious and historical animosities with Pakistan, there's no way that uh, India can win over Pakistan to its side to uh, weaken China. So it's got to be a situation where we have some bridges open with the Chinese so that um, what Indians fear the most is uh, what we call a two-front war. That we are simultaneously facing an attack both from the Chinese and from the Pakistanis. Uh, the Indian Chief of Military, General Rawat, recently made a comment that we are ready for a two-and-a-half-front war. He means China-Pakistan plus internal um, Maoist insurgents in some parts of India. Uh, I don't think we are ready for it. I think that's just bravado because um, if at all there is a two-front war, uh, the, if you look at the balance of forces, of course India is far more superior to Pakistan in conventional terms, but China is far more superior to India in conventional terms. So the goal remains that while we, that Modi has in fact uh, gone very, very far with the United States um, in terms of cementing the existing relationship and uh, making it a strategic partnership. Uh, he has done things that no other Indian government has even contemplated. For example, um, a logistics agreement where the US military and the Indian military actually share bases. Uh, India has traditionally been very anti-imperial and anti-Western in its thinking uh, since independence. But um, lately, Modi has in many ways uh, signaled a new readiness uh, to take the relationship with the US far deeper, especially in defense in military cooperation. Um, so, and he continues to invest a lot of his own time and diplomacy in uh, working with the US. Um, 
so although trump has been a kind of like a in a way of course it's, it's a global setback but even in this region he, he has overturned many of the assumptions we had before but nonetheless modi continues to um, believe that that's one way we can ward off or withstand as i said the chinese threat um but at the same time uh, because of the pakistan factor mm, there is a belief that we cannot be seen to be an ally of the united states against china so we use the term strategic partner for united states and not an ally and we have um although we have shed some inhibitions about who we work with uh internationally there is still a kind of a door that's open for china uh which is kept open because of the vulnerability um and the fear that the closer we go to the united states again to put it very simply the closer we go to the united states the more trouble the chinese can cause for us via pakistan via the the chinese navy the chinese uh corporate houses that are you know taking over um whole countries through what in india we call creditor imperialism which is a belt and road initiative where weaker uh, poorer countries uh, in are inviting the chinese to take over most of their strategic spaces and assets and their entire infrastructure and growth uh, plans um so reliance on the united states after trump and the unpredictability and the uncertainty that he naturally brings we we are now cautious about being over reliant on the united states and but doesn't mean that we are um willing to somehow acquiesce in chinese hegemony um india often says that um, we want a multipolar asia and a multipolar world uh meaning multiple power centers which are roughly balanced and have equal strength in the world and also in asia uh and our argument is that the chinese also want a multipolar world but they want a unipolar asia which is primarily a sinocentric concept you know that the chinese uh, power and influence will uh, predominate so this is where um i think uh, as we move forward some of you may have heard in the news or read about this concept of the quad how many of you are familiar with that the quad great the quad represents um, a formation of four countries quad short for quadrilateral um india australia japan and united states these are supposed to be um four democracies that have shared values and shared concerns about china's rise um and just a few months ago in late 2017 the concept was revived uh driven by japanese push but also with a strong support from modi um this squad um had been floated way back in 2007 but then fell into kind of uh, dormancy because the chinese objected to all these countries ganging up quote and quote against china to try and contain you know the chinese said this is all cold war stuff this is an american uh, game to try and uh, prevent china from rising and all that so um in fact in 2007 when the quad first met and they had a annual military exercise of these four countries um it was objected to by the chinese and eventually the indians at that time um felt that they should not antagonize china beyond a point so what has changed now 2018 2017 is that modi says mm, i will pursue my interests even at the risk of upsetting the chinese and i don't mind it if they are upset because uh frankly um that should not become a hurdle in making my own choices uh, as to who i align with so now increasingly uh the quad is one uh concept that will have very very central importance to indian foreign policy 
and um, now that this is been revived there's going to be more not just military exercise but an attempt to frame an alternative to the belt and road initiative because japan is not happy with the belt and road either uh, australia of course is on board i believe officially it's australia's policy to be to accept belt and road initiative um, uh, but nonetheless as you are all aware um, there are concerns about rising chinese influence in your country uh, i've been following with great interest the <coughs> senator what's his name the one who had to quit dastari 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 um and uh, all the uh, all the um, allegations of influence buying and so on um and you know strangely these things echo in india uh where people say look this is how the chinese take over a vulnerable country and we should never be fall victim to that um there is a, by the way there is the same argument was made about aligning with the us some time ago uh there was a very strong left left wing communist and socialist parties in india which no longer have you know significant um say on in policy making because they have lost elections and all that but they would say the same thing saying you know the united states is surreptitiously taking over india and we should be independent but what modi has done is um uh, take india closer to the us uh, short of an alliance like a formal military alliance and in many ways overcome those you know what i call a cobwebs you know they had held back india from maneuvering among the major powers if we are equally distant from all um it was okay during the cold war period uh when we were equally distant from the soviet union and the united states at least on paper but to be equally distant between the us and china today is not a proposition for most uh, indian strategic thinkers because if we do that then it means that the chinese are getting ahead and bigger and stronger simple uh as to the us getting bigger and stronger that's not seen as a concern because first of all the united states is not getting bigger and stronger as you know materially um and militarily um the united states is relatively in decline so there's no way that the united states can still be seen as a kind of a hegemonic threat to india but on the other hand we have this giant neighbor which is which is seen as propping up pakistan against us and you can see what choice we are making so definitely are uh, tilted towards the west but at the same time modi has this slogan of india first it's much before trump came with the america first thing uh from 2013 2014 modi has been talking about this and what he means is that we are going to be less apologetic in our foreign policy and we are going to do more adventurous things more ambitious things new initiatives we are going to relook at important countries uh, and different parts of the world in fresh light for example israel that's another you know current example for you to understand um no indian prime minister had ever visited israel before modi did in 2017 70 years after independence some 25 years after india uh, recognized israel in 1992 not a single prime minister had dared to visit israel and the reason was one a kind of a general solidarity for the palestinian cause two um fear of um of um upsetting india's muslim minorities who naturally had a sympathy for the palestinian cause and so Modi is the one who is saying I have a lot of economic and military interests with Israel and I'm going to put India first and not any you know specific what in India is called a vote bank you know this community or that community that may have an objection to uh having cooperation with Israel so um he has likewise done a lot with uh, as i said with the persian gulf countries um like saudi qatar UAE um in east asia with japan japan has become i would say almost like a um a de facto ally for india lately 
and Modi and Shinzo Abe have traversed a vast distance in you know, the last three years. Of course, India and Japan were uh, pally even before this, but something moved in a very big way in terms of military cooperation, in terms of Japanese investment in this country, in terms of working together um, to stabilize the Indo-Pacific as part of the Quad and even bilaterally. So uh, Modi has at some times shown a kind of very strategic ruthlessness in, these, in pursuing these relationships. Whenever he faced objectors within the Indian system, he would either ignore them or actually eliminate them. So I remember 2015, he fired a foreign secretary um, who belonged to the old school and was saying that we should be cautious and not antagonize the Chinese too much. And he said, no, I want full-throated, whatever you want to call it, partnership or alliance with Japan. And that's the only way we can survive in the Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific, by showing intent and by working with these like-minded countries, not to be, um, um, uh, not, to, not to get browbeaten by Chinese objections or Chinese threats. So likewise with Israel, as I said, he has overcome lots of taboos, historical taboos. Um, similar things uh, are expected now um, with, uh, with um, Australia. Uh, but Australia, interestingly, is seen by many Indian strategists as a kind of a weak link within the Quad because of the dependence on China and um, the relative decline of the United States. Especially after the end of the Obama era, uh, most Indians think that Trump does not really have any grand strategy uh, for the Indo-Pacific. Um, most Indians are of the belief that um, Trump is just you know, strategy free, to put it mildly. And uh, so therefore, um, you know, whether anyone can really rely on the US um, to be the net security provider in the Asia Pacific anymore is doubtful. And Trump is domestically um, preoccupied and doesn't seem to have any grand strategy or vision. So therefore, uh, our, even if some of his advisors do have it, um, he you know, seems to have, have a mind of his own which is completely um, um, inverting the traditional US foreign policy stance towards this region for the last uh, 60, 70 years. So in that scenario, uh, there are weak links. Um, and therefore, it's not just diplomacy. At the end of the day, India will have to come back to what we call self-help, right? Which means more and higher economic growth is essential. Um, to be sustained for 10 years or so, to be able to, to catch up. For your information, uh, India is only one-fourth the size of China in GDP. Um, and about one-fourth uh, in overall military capabilities to, to that of China. So for bridging this gap and for balancing and for reducing the imbalance of power that's emerged in Asia, India will not just have to rely on the US or Japan or Australia or Indian Ocean. All these are fine, but end of the day, we will also need to um, significantly grow and keep growing uh, so that we have a surplus to be able to invest overseas. There is an attempt to create a new um, connectivity corridor, which is not going to be so big like uh, Belt and Road Initiative of the Chinese, but uh, which could be meaningful and parallel to that we are calling it Asia Africa Growth Corridor. And this is going to have Japanese and American support financially. And India is supposed to be the implementer of this, or at least the one with the maximum presence in, in Africa. Uh, Latin America remains right now still too distant for India to contemplate any kind of playing a major role there. Um, so unlike the Chinese, we are way, way, way behind in being able to project any influence or you know, enter into strategic agreements in, uh, in Latin America. So, um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's work in progress. And uh, there is a lot of um, uh, 
debate within India about whether our democratic system and the party politics and you know the fierce rivalries and the competition uh, hobbles our foreign policy or not. Modi has not been hobbled because he won a clean victory with a um, you know a majority in the last parliamentary elections in 2014, and the next one is coming up 2019, which is a, just about a year away. And many people believe that foreign policy takes a back seat as we get closer to elections, because that's when, you know, the entire political class is focused on domestic issues. Um, but I think um, my, uh, in my book, I argue that Modi is definitely going to do two terms, by which I mean at least 10 years. So he will, um, whether and by what margin he's going to win in 2019, I don't know. Uh, there are many more, uh, you know, domestic political um, pundits who can explain that better than me. But my own view is that he will be around until 2024. Um, other things remaining constant. And that means that India has a window to catch up with China. And also simultaneously um, keep doing these things that is already done, all these taboo breaking new uh, innovative ideas that I mentioned. Uh, so overall, I think uh, unlike um, many parts of the richer world, richer, richer parts of the world like Europe and the, and, and the US, which are drawing more and more inward um, because of this right wing populism and all that, um, and which are rejecting globalization and rejecting outward looking um, attitudes, India under Modi remains very, very um, gung-ho about going out. In fact, the Chinese had this uh, term called going out uh, in the 1990s. They called it a going out strategy, where they promoted their corporations, public sector, large uh, state-owned enterprises to go out and acquire um, industries and enter into joint ventures overseas. and. Uh, for the military to go out, for the uh, you know the diplomacy to spread out, and especially in Africa and Latin America. So right now, India is at that stage where it believes that, as I said, global is local. Uh, so going out and being uh, outwardly oriented is very much still. You in in our jargon, we call it a liberal kind of foreign policy, which is based on reaching out to the rest of the world and building new co-op, you know, partnerships and all that. So that is still very much uh, the basis driving Indian foreign policy. And I see that this effort to go global, in my book I have a whole chapter on the Indian diaspora and how they have become very, very central to Modi's going out strategy or, you know, globalization of Indian foreign policy. Um, there's also a lot of effort to bring back um, you know cultural diplomacy and repackage it in a different way and to make india more attractive internationally um, there is um, i think um, a lot of what i call g2p government to people outreach public diplomacy in other words that they have done um, and um, many other such innovations i mean i can go on and on but i'll stop at this point and i'll request you know, you to gather some thoughts and maybe questions so we can continue this. So overall, let me just end by saying that um, India is in a sweet spot. And uh, I think we're going to be um, this way for the foreseeable future demographically, in terms of political leadership, and um, definitely this activist foreign policy that I just spoke about. So um, we are still upbeat about this country and uh, despite all its problems, we, f we see that this gap I spoke about between the potential and the reality um, is getting narrower. So thank you very much. Please. Um, 
Thank you. Um, that's a good one. Well, we are still close to the Russians uh, in terms of defense and military cooperation. You know, 70% of India's um, uh, armaments are um, Russian made and we continue to co-develop and co-produce lots of advanced uh, weapon systems with the Russians. Uh, but you're right that the salience of Russia has declined. And the reason for it is simple. I mean, Russia has declined. In other words, um, it doesn't have the same capabilities, for example, for technology transfer and such things, or, or it's not a major economic power either. Uh, it's primarily a military power. Um, so while we are, we usually echo the Russian positions on most global problems even now, even today. Uh, but it's just that um, they are seen to be less relevant insofar as our goal of uh, checking the Chinese hegemony goes because they are not, um, to an extent, Putin has accommodated Russia and has improved ties with Russia significantly to the point of calling it an alliance with Russia, uh, with China. Uh, and secondly, as I said, Russia doesn't have the kind of things that India needs for its economic modernization. Just to give you an example, um, US-India bilateral trade uh, per annum is now over $100 billion American. Um, US, Russia, uh, sorry, India-Russia bilateral trade is just 10 billion. So um, our industries, our corporations, our um, you know uh, uh, trade uh, trading houses, none of them see much value in Russia, which is economically a one product economy, right? It's based only on petroleum, on 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 oil and gas. So it doesn't have the same kind of dynamic potential. I mean, just to give you an example. You look at our IT majors that generate a lot of revenue from exporting software, Tata Consultancy, Wipro, Infosys, all of them depend largely on clients in North America. You know, so um, they say that, you know, our bread is buttered on this side, you know, in that sense. So there's no way uh, Russia can come in as an alternative. Um, but Russia remains important from in the military domain. And uh, we have done some extraordinary supersonic missiles and such things with them and continue to uh, our fighter jets, our advanced military platforms, many of them are, are Russian made. So that remains. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we've not been able to sustain. So it's a very pragmatic thing, you know, um, that it no longer is seen as so reliable uh, to be able to push back the Chinese influence. While the US, I mean, as I said, Trump has created the same uncertainty about the U.S. and whether it's willing to, but still, uh, there is a, the United States has something called, um, 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 you know, a Pacific Command, you know, with a very large force projection to be able to try and push back China. Russia doesn't have such an intention um, to be able to do that, so therefore, it has lost its salience, but it's still, you know, uh, one of our important strategic partners. Yeah, any, any, any more thoughts? Yes, please. Uh, probably a few things. I guess I want to put into this question, but ultimately I want to ask, what do you see as India's attraction uh, to, to other countries for wanting to promote India as the global superpower? Uh, I guess one of the things I would be like you to focus on and possibly is global warming. Yeah, great. Well, you know, we often uh, market ourselves as the world's largest democracy, right? So being democratic uh, with multi-party system and uh, where generally the people's will is reflected in who rules us, that is seen as uh, an important um, attribute that sets India apart from most of its, um, you know, major uh, neighbors uh, in Asia. Um, Southeast Asia, as you know, all the countries, uh, barring the Philippines and even that too is now dubious under uh, Rodrigo Duterte, uh, are undemocratic. And uh, China, of course, is uh, a one-party authoritarian state 
with uh, very few political and civil liberties. So India likes to think of itself as important and attractive because it's democratic and at the same time is slowly but surely um, lifting its people out of poverty. This is seen as, you know, uh, something that's unique and which should assure the rest of the world because, um, you know, an authoritarian state is opaque. Uh, you don't have many debates in authoritarian states for other people to see, for the outside world to see, to gauge their intentions. But India is kind of transparent because all these debates I mentioned are being held out in public. And uh, in that sense, it's more attractive. It's seen as, you know, even if the United States is in decline, we have India, right? Like it's democratic and it has a liberal tradition and um, that will, you know, carry the torch forward, you know. So, that, so that's one of the aspects. Um, economic um, rights and ob obviously the Chinese have done much better than us in, um, you know, eradicating poverty and industrialization job creation, those kind of things. So in terms of those, I mean, India has a relatively weaker record to, to, be, to be able to sell to the rest of the world in terms of attraction. So, but definitely civil and political rights um, by any index. I mean, you lose any standard one like the Freedom House Index of countries um, which are ranked as per civil and political liberties. India is way, way above China. Um, so those are, I think, the things that stand us apart. And human rights is a subset of that. Uh, as far as climate goes, I think we are doing well on one front. I know the air here is terrible and I heard some of you are unwell. I'm sorry about that, but um, if you take the larger uh, national perspective, um, we are doing very well in terms of renewables. Um, solar and wind and the transition away from fossil fuels. Um, is happening faster than projected in the Paris uh, Climate Accord. Uh, India has committed that by 2030, 40% of our energy mix will come from non-fossil fuel sources. I mean renewables, like wind, solar, nuclear. So um, the last I heard was that we are ahead of schedule and we'll be able to achieve that uh, mix by 2025 at the current rate at which it's happening. So, uh, and Modi has started something called an International Solar Alliance, um, which is a group of countries which are meant to um, come together to promote solar energy, not just the level of ideas, but by creating a kind of a financing platform for transition away from fossil fuels um, and for seed funding and all these things. So, um, and the Indians always like to point out the fact that we may be the third largest emitter of carbon uh, in absolute terms, but when you look at the per capita uh, emissions, we are one of the lowest, like not even the, in the top 10, we are probably like the 20th or something like that. Um, so our carbon footprint is relatively light. Uh, and India has played a very important role in the climate change negotiations for Paris. So um, in that sense, although Xi Jinping likes to project China as the, you know, the new torchbearer for globalization, um, India also has a claim to that. Uh, it's just that it's not as powerful as China is at present. But India is also doing similar things vis-a-vis um, -vis trade and climate change and all the big migration, all the big global issues. India generally tends to have a liberal outlook. Um, and which is seen as, um, you know, the contrast to what Trump and some of the European populists are doing right now. So uh, if you take all, and then there are the usual things I mentioned earlier, you know, the Kama Sutra and yoga and Bollywood and all those things continue to be promoted uh, to try and increase India's attraction in the world. But um, I think India has a phrase, we call ourselves the net security providers as in, in the Indian Ocean region, which means smaller countries that don't have navies of their own, that don't have um, naval um, surveillance and monitoring capabilities, that don't have um, you know, standing armies of their own, 
they uh, we can receive Indian protection and support. Um, that's uh, something that we are is still aspirational. So that again increases India's attraction. If you're really a provider of security, and Modi is famous for saying that, you know, all this while we have been asking, telling the world what we want, and now I want the world to come and tell us what they want from India, and I'm willing to give it. So he has put on this whole, you know, um, new. Um, projection of India as a giver of public goods uh, to smaller neighbors and to in the Indian Ocean region and beyond in Africa and so on. So those will ultimately, you know, increase your attraction because the reason the Chinese, I mean, there's a, there's a famous um, quote I want to share with you by the former president of Tanzania, Jakai Kikwete. Kikwete was asked, what's the difference between China and India? And he says, um, you see all these hospitals out here in my country, each one of them is built by Chinese money and by Chinese engineers. And you see all the doctors and the nurses working in them, each one of them is trained by the Indians. So what he's saying is our relative strengths are such, I mean, if you want to really mark a distinction between China and India and say, what is India's attraction? It's our human resources. You know, um, there are some immensely talented individuals. Um, and, 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 and um, social movements in this country that have been rendering services not just for India's people but also uh, around the world. And we have to increase that, you know. I've been an advocate for India starting something like the US Peace Corps or what uh, the OSAID um, in Australia does. You have that volunteer program, right, where you can go work overseas in developing countries. What do you call it? No, 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 it's an Australian government thing where young people can go work overseas on a stipend as teachers and, yes, sir? It's IES. How, how do you? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one. So I've been, I've been studying all these models and saying that we must do something like that because that's another way where we can, uh, you know, project our influence and uh, increase our attraction among the people of the world, not just with governments or with corporate houses. So hopefully some new initiatives are coming up in the years uh, to come. So, um, okay, I, I'll stop there. Any more comments? Yes, sir, please. In please. Context, yes, in the context of the strategic rivalry with China, which you painted, the general relation with China, can you say something about the relevance of and possible future debates? Thank you. Um, I think uh, we tend to see the BRICS as a multilateral initiative for changing the global order overall and to shift um, decision making away from Europe and North America to developing countries. Um, and the way BRICS has been structured is on the principle of equality of the members in terms of say and in terms of voting share and in terms of even the paid up capital. For example, in the new development bank of the BRICS, each member country has an equal um, amount of capital, irrespective of their real sizes, in terms of, irrespective of their real might. Um, so uh, BRICS is seen as an important experiment to usher in a multilateral world. So there, um, our, the, the strategic competition with China does not figure. For example, when we have BRICS uh, summits or BRICS um, working groups and committees and all these forums, the Indians and the Chinese do not spar over bilateral issues there. Um, and um, the Chinese don't try to block India or vice versa. Usually they operate on consensus basis. Um, so it's a kind of a pragmatic um, bifurcation of the bilateral. We, the, the idea is that we cannot destroy the larger vision of the developing world and hold them ransom by washing out dirty linen in front of them. So therefore, the border disputes and the military um, rivalries and the uh, struggle for power is usually separated from BRICS. Uh, and uh, I must say that the BRICS institutional achievements are significant, even though there are many in the West who are skeptical, saying, oh, well, you know, the Chinese and Indians will be at loggerheads and this organization will never go ahead, you know, and will never be able to achieve anything significant. So 
I think we have been fairly successful. The bilateral dynamics, by the way, the same thing holds true for SARC, you know, which is the South Asian re regional grouping of eight member countries. Now, for a long time, people said that because India and Pakistan were always contesting each other, the rest of the uh, six member states were being um, cheated out of the prospects of closer regional integration. And that essentially if two big pillars in a larger grouping are at war with each other, then it undermines the overall potential of this grouping. But that's not been the case. I mean, in the last three years, we've done a lot with all the SOC countries except Pakistan. So there's a plenty happening with Bhutan, with Bangladesh, with Nepal, with Sri Lanka, with Maldives, uh, and so on. Um, so Modi calls it SARC minus one. So um, that's been going ahead. Uh, regional cooperation, there are lots of new initiatives and attempt to improve intra-regional trade and commerce and connectivity and those kind of things. So likewise, we can do, I think, with in BRICS. Um, and I think both countries see value in it. Uh, as ways to achieve the ultimate goal of a multipolar world. So you have to look at the nuances. I mean, a broad brush would say BRICS will never work. The Chinese and the Indians, you know, are enemies. But another way of looking at it is this is a larger grouping and both of them see value in it and both of them do cooperate on certain issues of common interest. That's why I said earlier that we cannot completely close our doors to the Chinese, uh, even though we are tilting towards the West. All right, thank you for that last question, Professor Williams. I think if there's any more questions, we can perhaps take it offline. Um, in fact, Professor Williams and Professor Charlie have a, have a meeting in a few minutes, so the questions may flow in that meeting. But for the rest of you, that wraps up the seminars. Monash Murrow, you know you've got an optional activity now, and then you guys can all prepare for your evening event. Um, I'd like you to first, before we leave, join me in thanking Professor Charlie. For that thank you, thank you.